Okay. Um, welcome to September 1st. My name is Dave Bly. I'm going to talk about topic models. I'm from, oops, I didn't mean to do that. I'm from uh, Princeton University in New Jersey, where it's 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and so this is what it's going to look like to teach at 4 in the morning. Um, OK, and please interrupt me a lot in this talk so that it'll help stimulate me to wake me up. <laughs> OK, good. So what topic modeling is about is that, as you all know, it's almost redundant, um, more information becomes available to us, it becomes more difficult for us to be able to quickly access it and search for things in it and understand it and basically get something out of it. And so we need new tools, new algorithmic tools, to help us organize, search, and understand these vast amounts of information, things like text archives and image archives and all different kinds of data that we're all just both creating and having access to constantly. So what topic modeling provides are methods for automatically organizing, understanding, searching, summarizing, exploiting these large electronic archives. And the basic idea are, is, is, are these three steps. First, we take a big corpus like Wikipedia, say, and uncover the hidden topical patterns that pervade it. So Wikipedia's got some number of millions of articles, and they're about some things. Those things overlap. And we want to uncover what those things are. What are the different topics that pervade this collection? Um, then we want to annotate the documents according to those topics. So I understand what the, say, you know, 250 topics in Wikipedia are. Now if I pluck a document out of Wikipedia, what topics is that article about? How can I annotate that article according to the topics I've discovered in step one? And finally, we want to use these annotations to organize, summarize, and do whatever it is we want to do. Obviously, well not obviously, but doing this in a vacuum is only so interesting. We really want to say, OK, now that I've been able to essentially mark up my collection according to these automatically found topics, I want to use that marked up collection. You can think of it as if I had 10 million people to go through Wikipedia and, and carefully organize it, then what would I do with their organization? Since I don't have those 10 million people, I build algorithms to do that for me. OK. Oops. Oh, this is backwards. It's the same. I've been almost hit by cars about six times already. So <laughs> same idea. OK. Um, so what we can do with, with topic models are things like discover topics from a corpus. So here are some topics. So a topic is going to be a distribution over terms in a vocabulary. And these are the top most probable terms in four topics that were uncovered by analyzing the texts in the, in the journal Science. So here's a topic, human genome, DNA, genetic, evolution, evolutionary, species, organisms, disease, host, bacteria, diseases, computer models, information, data, computers. These are words that seem to go together in some kind of thematic, thematically coherent way. But I should say that part of this talk, probably on Thursday, we're going to discuss the pitfalls of overly interpreting these probability distributions over words. But for now, since we're learning about it, we can uh, pretend like those pitfalls don't exist and interpret them. So um, these are four topics discovered from the journal Science. Okay. Oh yeah. Uh, why usually in topic modeling we don't use the like uh, or, uh, the plural? There, there's no good reason not to stem. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you know, sometimes stemming. I mean, when I when I fit a topic model, sometimes uh, I use stemming. It can be when you're looking at these topics. If you're doing this for like a system for someone to be able to to quickly browse and navigate through documents. Some stemmers can be overly, uh, what's the word, aggressive. And you can't really recognize the roots that they, that they give back. Um, but then there's one that I know my student likes. I can't remember what it's called, but it's a more conservative stemmer. It just, it will remove things like computer and computers. OK. Um, but no, there's, stemming is a good idea. Other questions? OK. Um, things like. So discovering topics, discovering topics and understanding how the words change 
how in, within the topic through time. So here are here is time from 1880 until 2000, and here are two different topics that I've named. Again, ignoring the pitfalls of naming topics, and here are some words in those topics, and you can see how their probability is changing over time. Okay, we can we can uncover these time changing topics with topic models. Um, we can model connections between topics. So. Here, again, are lists of words that we are interpreting as topics. And again, this is from science, the science articles. And here are topics and how they tend to co-occur with other topics. So you see here, um, we have this topic, ancient found impact million years ago in Africa. And it connects to this topic, fossil record, birds, fossils, dinosaurs, fossil. OK, those two topics tend to co-occur. Whereas this dinosaur topic, everyone loves dinosaurs, doesn't um, connect as much with, say, this topic about mice, antigen, T cells, antigens, there's this issue again, um, and immune response. Okay, so finding connections between topics. Um, and finally, we can use these tools not just on text data, um, but on lots of different kinds of data. For example, on images, um, topic modeling has, has um, help make some progress in computer vision, and we can also combine these different types of um, of data type, these different types of data. Here, we're using the topic model to automatically annotate images. So in this model, you, the input to the algorithm are images and words that describe them. And again, by using this, this set of ideas that we're going to be discussing for the next while, um, you can take a raw image after fitting the model and automatically annotate it. Here, we have this image of a fish, and the annotation is fish, water, ocean, tree, coral. Okay, it's not perfect. There's, I don't think there's a tree in here, but um, this is another, another application of, of topic modeling. And there, the idea is that the same way that we think of, oh, I don't have a picture of a document anywhere, the same way we think of a document as a collection of words, you can think of an image as a collection of image features, either by running some algorithms on it in advance to segment it and then computing features of each segment, or by doing something silly like just gridding it and computing features of each uh, square in the grid, and then you can treat the image like a document. Okay. okay. I was deciding between coffee and water just then. Okay. So, um, that's kind of the one perspective or motivation for topic modeling. Since this is a machine learning summer school, um, I, you know, sometimes I think of topic modeling on one hand, it's about taking our intuitions and maybe other scholarship about the structure of language and images and encoding it into, into good machine learning algorithms. But from the machine learning perspective, topic modeling can be seen as a case study in applying basically hierarchical Bayesian models to grouped data, like documents or images. And, and thinking of topic modeling as an application of these ideas, it really touches on a lot of different pieces in the applied Mach, uh, statistical machine learning world. Things like directed graphical models, conjugate priors and non-conjugate priors, time series modeling, modeling with graphs, hierarchical Bayesian methods, um, fast approximate posterior inference like MCMC or variational methods, exploratory data analysis, model selection non-parametric Bayesian methods, and mixed membership models. So in this talk we're going to touch on all of these, all these topics. I know you're going to go into these topics in more detail in other lectures in the school. Um, but if you're interested in any of these things, I would encourage you to think of topic modeling as a possible application for, for your ideas in one of these contexts. It's a, it's a nice way, for example, to test out new methods of approximate posterior inference and so on. OK? OK. So. The way I had planned this is that we'd start by talking about latent Dirichlet allocation, which is like the simplest topic model, I guess, um, and then discuss in some detail approximate posterior inference. Um, I was going to talk about Gibbs sampling and variational inference, and then talk a little bit about comparing the different approximate posterior inference algorithms that are available to you, um, and give some advice, apparently. I didn't. I don't know. I think I might have written that before I made the slides, because I don't think there's much advice in there. Um, and then in the second part, I want to talk about 
taking the assumptions of LDA and relaxing them in various ways. So um, one is to build topic models for prediction, relational and supervised topic models. The other is to relax the Dirichlet assumption and hence the, the conjugacy assumption and look at the logistic normal as a tool to building different kinds of topic models. There we'll discuss dynamic and correlated topic models. Um, and finally, briefly, I'll talk about infinite topic models, which is otherwise known as, or which is an application of the hierarchical Dirichlet process. I know EY Tay will discuss that in much more detail um, next week. Um, then finally, I want to discuss interpreting and evaluating topic models, which is kind of a, a thorn in the side of topic models, to be frank. Um, but we'll talk about it. Yeah? Um, will you make the assumption that documents are bags of words all the time? Um, Implicitly? Because you think you're sort of making it here. Well, I haven't talked about anything yet, no, but... Um, <laughs> It, right, it does seem like I'm going to make that assumption the whole time, and yes, I will, yeah. But I'll be, but I'll be totally honest with you about it. Bags of features. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I that's right. Um, yeah, so to answer the question, I like that question. Yes, I think we're going to assume that documents are bags of words everywhere, but I'll try to point you to some. There's been some excellent work out there um, that, that takes the same ideas and, and relaxes that assumption, basically allows documents to be to have Markovian structure, for example. Um, but yes, we will be explicit, and we will assume that documents are bags of words here. These are exchangeable, exchangeable models. Good question. I'm sorry I answered it with a joke. I often do that. It's no offense. Yeah. OK. <laughs> Other questions that will be politely answered? <laughs> OK. Um, OK. Let's talk about that. All right. So now we'll start this uh, talk in earnest. Um, so latent Dirichlet allocation is a probabilistic model. And I'm sure you've heard this already in this, in this uh, series. But the idea behind probabilistic modeling is to, one, treat your data as observations that arise from some kind of generative probabilistic process. This is generative probabilistic modeling, I should say. Um, and one that includes hidden variables, uh, structure that, that, that we want to find in the data. So for documents, those hidden variables reflect the thematic structure of the collection that we don't have access to. Um, step two is to then infer that hidden structure using posterior inference. Basically, we're going to contemplate and compute the conditional distribution of the hidden variables given the observations, which, is, which are the documents themselves. Third, we want to situate new data into the estimated model, typically. Sometimes you might want to just analyze your documents and then look at the hidden variables as is and never, never believe that you'll see another piece of data again. Um, but often, you want to take your model and then you have some new data coming in that you want to do something with. And so you need to be able to situate that new data into the estimated model. In other words, how does this query or new document fit into the topic structure that I learned in the first part? Okay. Um, okay, so the intuition, so with, with this kind of general recipe for probabilistic modeling, the intuition behind latent Dirichlet allocation, or LDA, is simply that documents exhibit multiple topics. Okay, so here's uh, an example. I think there's a way to do this. Oh, okay. Um. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Oh, good. So uh, here's an example. So this is an article from the journal Science called Seeking Life's Bare Genetic Necessities. And this article is basically about um, computing the number of genes that an organism needs to survive uh, evolutionary, evolutionarily. Um, and what I've done is I've highlighted different words in this article with different colors. So words like predictions, computer analysis, computational, computer, numbers, I manually highlighted those in blue. These are words about data analysis. Um, words like genes, genomes, sequenced, these are uh, highlighted in yellow. These are words about genomics. And words like life and organisms and survive, words about evolutionary biology, I've highlighted these words in pink. Okay? So the intuition that I'm, I'm trying to convey is that this document somehow combines words about 
computer analysis, words about evolutionary biology, and words about genomics. Okay? In contrast to the assumptions made by a mixture model, which says that all of these words come from a single component, a single topic. Okay, so with that intuition in mind, the idea is to express it as a generative probabilistic process. And the way that works is this. So, first we are going to posit that there are some number of topics, which we'll now formally define, um, that live outside of the document collection. Okay? Um, so, here I have four topics listed. There might be uh, 96 underneath it, and each topic is a distribution over terms in the vocabulary. All right, so there's a fixed vocabulary, we're going to assume that, and every topic is a distribution over that fixed vocabulary. But different topics have different words with different probabilities. So for example, at the top, I see a topic that has word, and here, let's say I've, I've ordered these words in order of their probability. So at the top, we have a, a topic that has gene with probability 0.04, DNA with probability 0.02, genetic with probability 0.01, and so on. Okay, so I'm calling that the genetics topic. Um, underneath it, the pink topic, the word life is probability 0.02, evolve 0.01, and organism 0.01. Then I have a topic in green about neuroscience with words like brain and neuron and nerve with high probability. And finally, a topic data number and computer with high probability. Okay, so when I say topic, what I'm going to mean is distribution over fixed vocabulary. But that's cumbersome, so we say topic. Yeah? Can these words uh, lie in different topics? Can they what? Lie in the, um, belong to different topics. Yeah, that's an important point. The, every topic contains a probability for every word. So even though it doesn't have high probability, the word data has some probability in the yellow topic. And it might be that if you have a word that, um, a word can have high probability in two topics. For example, it's an example you're probably sick of, the word bank could have probability in a topic about financial uh, instruments and also high probability in a topic about bodies of water for river bank. Other questions? Okay, good. Ah, we'll, we'll get there. Yep. Good question. That's going to be the next, the next thing. Okay. Um, so, let's assume for now that those probabilities are all there. And we've got our topics, and, the, and, and there's a hundred of them. The generative process for each document then works like this. First, we're going to choose a distribution over our topics. So while a topic is a distribution over terms, a distribution over topics is a distribution over these 100 elements. Okay, so if there are 100 topics, then this distribution has 100 possible, um, possible values, each one color coded by its topic. And here, I've chosen one that has pink with some probability, yellow with some probability, and blue with some probability. Clear? And we're going to draw that from a Dirichlet distribution. Have you seen the Dirichlet yet? Have you seen the Dirichlet yet in this series? No? Okay, so good. We'll talk about that. This is drawn from a distribution over distributions called a Dirichlet. And um, that's the first step in generating a document. The second step is to repeatedly draw a coin from this distribution. So here I drew a blue coin. Look up what topic that blue coin refers to, the blue topic. That's why you got to color code them. It's real important. And then choose the word from that distribution. Okay, so here I, I, I rolled this 100-sided die, I got blue, I drew a word analysis from the blue distribution. Okay, here I drew, I can't point this way, let's see. Uh, I'm not good with shadows, so we won't do it that way. Um, here I chose yellow, I got the yellow coin, and then I looked up the yellow distribution and got the word genome. And somewhere else I chose the pink coin and I got the word organism and life. And now going back to your question, you can see that, um, oh, you know, thanks, Zubin. The jumping kind of was good, but this is, can't last. What's that? Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, that's nice. It's green. Green is, um, that's good. You know, it's, it's more positive than red, which is like stop. Green is go. Um, what were we saying? Oh yeah, so, 
so, so we choose these coins, and then we choose the word from the corresponding distribution. Here we chose the yellow coin, we choose the word genetic. Here we chose the pink coin, we choose the word organism, and so on and so forth. And this get, gets to your question. I'm implicitly assuming now that the order of words doesn't matter, okay? Because I'm choosing these coins independently of each other. Now, of course, documents aren't really made this way. Um, if they were, they would be totally unreadable. But if you, um, or I should say when they are, they are totally unreadable. But um, if you had a document whose words were all shuffled and you looked, at, you looked at those words, you might be able to get a sense that, oh, this is a document about genetics, computation, and evolutionary biology by looking at the various types of words that occur in the document. Okay, so it's important that the generative process doesn't have to be a precise description or a plausible description of how the document arose. It, in fact, doesn't even have to generate documents that look realistic. It just has to be a process that makes sense for your goal, which is in looking at the posterior, finding these thematically coherent terms. And a little later, we'll discuss how one, well, we, we won't discuss it much, but we'll, we'll try to think about how this generative process leads to these types of, of probabilities in the posterior. But we, we'll get there. Um, but is this generative process clear? So this is important the whole rest of the talk. Depends on it. First, choose a distribution over topics. Then, for each, for, for each word, draw a, a a colored coin from this distribution, look up the distribution over terms associated with that coin and draw the word from that distribution. And then, that's the generative process for a single document. And then for another document, we repeat the same process. So notice that documents are going to have different distributions over topics. So while this document is about the pink, yellow, and blue topic, another document might be about the green and blue topic, a, a document about computational neuroscience, for example. Okay, and we repeat this process for every document. Clear? Any questions? Yeah. We're going to get right. We're going to get there. This is this is just the imaginary generative probabilistic process that we're assuming our data came from. And what we're assuming in particular is that we've got these and we've got a process for this. Okay. Other questions? Okay. So, the problem is, of course, we don't get to see any of this, right? This is what we're imagining is there, and this is what we'd like to exploit and use. But in reality, all we have is a big stack of 10 million documents. So our goal is going to be to infer the underlying topic structure. Given all these documents, first of all, possibly most interesting, what are the topics that generated them under, this, under these assumptions? What are the distributions over terms that generated them under these assumptions? And for each document, what is the distribution over topics associated with that document? And maybe we care about, for each word, which topic generated each word. Okay, and that's the algorithmic problem here, is to, is to compute this, this posterior distribution. This is a conditional distribution of all of these latent variables given the observations, which are the words of the documents. Clear? Not clear? No, not not clear. Good. OK. So that's sort of the fun part, and it's over. Um, uh, I'm serious. So. We're going to encode this model in a graphical model, directed graphical model. So I want to, I know you've seen these already. I want to just quickly review them so that we're all on the same page about the semantics of directed graphical models. Um, in a directed graphical model, a node is a random variable. So here I have nodes y and x1 through xn. Edges denote possible dependence between random variables. So here the edge between y and x1 means that x1 might depend on y. xn might depend on y as well. Observed variables are shaded, so here I've observed x1 through n. I have not observed y. y is a hidden variable or a latent variable. Those you can use interchangeably. And plates denote replicated structure. So instead of having to waste your ink on this big figure, you can shorthand it with y goes to xn and draw a box around xn, which is called a plate. And 
um, put big N in the lower right-hand corner to denote that we have big N of these little XNs, and they're all dependent possibly on Y. Clear? Okay. Um, maybe I should hold this too. So the structure of this graph defines the pattern of conditional independencies that are encoded in the joint distribution of these random variables. Right? So from this graph, we can read off all of the possible conditional independencies that uh, among these random variables, and, and the, the, the structure of the graph also defines a factorization of the joint distribution of these random variables. In particular here, this, here is the joint distribution of all of those random variables, y and x1 through xn, and this graph means that this joint distribution can be written as p of y times the product from n1 to n of p of xn given y. So you notice that, that just from this uh, joint distribution, you can see that x, the x's are all conditionally independent given y. Okay, so, so this and this and this all mean exactly the same thing. Questions? Okay, good. So, with this simple little language in our hands, we can write down the latent Dirichlet allocation model that I just described for you. Okay, and you can see why we need those plates. So each piece of this structure now is a random variable. And um, let's, the easiest way to understand this is to sandwich in from the outside into the middle, okay? So um, the first thing I'll tell you is to ignore eta and alpha for now. And theta, theta sub d, d is the document replication, are the topic proportions. That was that cartoon histogram that I drew for you with the pink and the blue and the yellow uh, bars. Okay, so that's called theta d, topic proportions. We have one of these for every document. It's in the d plate. Now, oh, I should have started over here. So beta k are the topics themselves. That's where we start. So each beta is a distribution over terms, and we have k of them. So k might be 100. All right, so, so beta sub 96 is some distribution over words. So beta lives on what we call the simplex, the, the, the vocabulary simplex. It's the space of all possible distributions, okay? And I'm assuming here that beta comes from a Dirichlet distribution, which is a, a distribution over these, the, over in this type of space, okay? So these are our 100 topics, and that's the K plate. Now we have the document plate. This is the corpus, and we first have theta D. These are the topic proportions, as I mentioned, the cartoon histogram. And it is of dimension k, because there are k topics. That's not really illustrated here. Then, for each word, that's the end plate inside the d plate. If you want to be real picky, you might want to put a little d here. Um, uh, we have zdn, call that the topic assignment. That's the colored coin from the picture. Okay, so. You can see that that depends on theta because it's drawn from a distribution with parameter theta. So if theta has probabilities for blue and yellow and pink, then ZDN might be pink, and it's drawn from that particular theta. Clear? And, and there is a Z for every word. Remember, there's a colored coin for every word. Okay? WDN depends on <coughs> ZDN and beta, all the betas. WDN is the nth word in the dth document. And notice that double WDN, which is difficult to say, is um, the only observed random variable in this whole model. Okay, all we observe are a bunch of words organized by document. Now why does W depend on Z and beta? That's not rhetorical. It could have been. That's right, selected from the topic. And, and, and so why is it, does it depend on all the betas? Because it's all the topics. The Be whole topics contain this word. Okay, so because all the topics contain this word, and what did you say? Well, that word is in all the topics. You said earlier that all words are contained in all topics. That's right, all, right. And so if this is going to encode the distribution of the words, then how do I, what is the probability of this word given Z and beta? Probability is that topic 
uh, existed period, or was maybe chosen period, and the probability that that word would have been chosen from that topic. Right. So, uh, well, I'll say close. Oh, that's almost right. So we're conditioning on z and all the betas. So the probability of the word, let's see if I can do this. So in the, in the joint distribution that this uh, graphical model represents, we have the probability of the word given z, so this is dn, given z dn and all the betas. And what you said is that it's the probability of seeing that topic and the probability of seeing that word under that topic. Is that what you said? No. What did you say? I said it's the probability of observing that word given the topic and the probability of observing that word given the topic assignment. And then, yeah, so the topic's like a prior to a topic assignment. Right. So, what it is, what this is, is I, I think I think you said what it is. It's the probability of observing this word from. Remember, z d n is a number from one to k because it comes from theta, and so you index the z d nth topic from beta one through k, and you look up the probability of w d n from that topic. Okay, so it's beta z d n comma WDN. Okay, it's basically we've got our K topics. Each one is a distribution over words. So if this is V and this is K, then our, our topics, this is sometimes called a topic matrix, our topics are each a distribution over all the V words, like we said. They all sum up to one. And in the generative process, once we've selected Z, we basically know which topic this word is coming from. So it might come from this topic here. And then we look up the particular cell of this word. So if this is WDN, that cell is WDN, this row. And this column is ZDN. Then we basically look up in beta the in, in the ZDNth column, the WDNth word, and get its probability from there. Okay, so that's why we have the observed WDN depend both on ZDN and all the betas. Because without observing them, we don't know which one it is. Right? We just know that it depends on both those things. And you can kind of see that functionally here. The, the probability of the word depends on both Z and beta. Clear? The probability of the word is the so the probability of the word given the topic assignment and all the topics is the WDNth entry in the ZDNth beta. It's the word WDNth entry in the topic assignment. Sorry, in the topic beta um, with index topic assignment ZDN. Did that make things less clear? Possibly. Do you have a question? Yeah, so just to clarify. Yeah. Um, when you're writing this formula here, you're doing as if set the end and only one value. And so you're saying that the word depends, like, has been generated only by one topic. That's right. And instead, um, ZDN probably is, like, is a distribution, and therefore we're going to sort of uh, margin without the ZDN at some point. W yes, OK. So well, to generate because a word might be coming from several different topics. Is that right? Okay. Uh, can, you, can you try to repeat the questions? Oh, yeah, sorry. Sure. Yeah. The question is that it looks like in this formula, I'm assuming that, um, well, the question was with Z, but I say Z, but we could say Z. Is Z, Z, N a distribution or is it a, I'm assuming it's a single value. I'm saying it's a topic assignment, a number from 1 to K, when really we don't observe it, so it's a distribution. That was the question. And the answer is, I'm very glad you asked that question. So here we're still living in the fantastical, magical world of treating our hidden variables as observed. 
Okay, so here I'm asking for the distribution of WDN given ZDN and beta 1 through K. Now we know, you and I both know secretly, they're not observed. So we're going to be putting posterior distributions. We're going to have a posterior over these things. But for formulating the model, the conditional, the, the, the conditional distribution that this graphical model begs us for is the probability of W given that I've observed the topic assignment and all of the topics. And in that fantastical world, ZDN is just a number from 1 to K. That's an important distinction. Theta D is a distribution over topics, even in the fantastical world. Because each Z comes from theta, and there can be multiple Zs for different words in the same document. But ZDN is a number from 1 to K. It's an index from 1 to K. Is that clear to everyone? OK, yeah. So isn't there an uh, expression like independence here? Like given the value of ZDN, W depends only on one of the beta. Exactly. So that's not being encoded here. Uh, encoded where? The graphical model doesn't tell you that. That's right. So the graphical model really just tells you what kinds of conditional independencies you can, um, you can assume here. And uh, right, the particular functional form of W given Z and beta, I'm specifying at the board here. Good point. Yeah? Do you assume that you have some kind of aggregate function uh, uh, from the patterns of W, D, and to W, D, like the maximum probability that uh, it can belong to one of the topics and topics contain this word, or are you going to learn it just from the data? Um, so, so there might be, yeah, this topic cannot, can be on this document, and it can cause this word with this probability, and the other one can cause this with a higher probability. So. <laughs> Is no idiom kind of an aggregate like a maximum of the Were there no, um, let me write down the joint distribution here. That'll clear up everything. Um, the answer is no. We're not assuming that there's any maximums or aggregate functions at play. Um, so, yeah, I'll turn the light on. Binding. That's what that works too. I did exactly what Zubin told me to do earlier, so <laughs> it's, it's got to work. All right, um, good. All right, so let's just, just let's just put everything uh, in in bright lights. Um, so again, fantastical world, everything's observed. What is the joint distribution of all of the hidden and observed variables according to this model? First, we have. each topic coming from some distribution that's appropriate over topics. That's going to be the Dirichlet. Okay, and so those are all independent of anything else. Um, and that's because these betas only depend on eta. Okay, that's the first part of this joint distribution. Now we have our documents. We have D documents. And what's the first random variable we generate for each document? the topic proportions, which depend on alpha. Again, that's a distribution, the Dirichlet distribution, that's appropriate for distributions over distributions. Okay, um, That's easier to understand if it's written down. Then within each document, we have the words of the document. Okay, um, this, The prints may not be necessary, but they make it all clearer. So for each document, there's n words in the document. Just for simplicity, we assume that all documents have exactly 552 words. And we first draw the topic assignment from theta d. Sorry. Right? That's akin to rolling the 100-sided die. OK? Finally, we draw the word condition on z dn and beta 1 through k. OK. That's the joint distribution of the observed and hidden random variables. And just so I said that this comes from a Dirichlet. And um, this comes from a Dirichlet, which we're going to talk about in a second. What is the probability of z dn given theta d? So if theta d is, here we have 100 topics, 
And here we have our probabilities of various of those topics. This is 13, 26, 39, and uh, 42, total coincidence. And, um, and let's say ZDN is 42. What's P of ZDN given theta D? Point three three, right? In general, what is P of ZDN given theta D? What's that? Exactly. Well, theta it's theta D comma ZDN. It's this ZDN indexes theta D. Okay? Same trick as before. And I should say that in the in the in the nitpicky mathematics of this, it's not exactly how you represent these random variables, but don't worry about it for now. We'll get there. Maybe we won't, but you'll get there. Um, so, that, so P Z D N given theta D equals that. And P of W D N given Z D N and beta 1 through K, we discussed, was a slightly more complicated thing, beta Z D N comma W D N. OK, so with this and this and these two facts, and this joint distribution here, we've fully specified the model, subject to telling you about the Dirichlet distribution. Clear? Good. OK. So other questions? OK, good. Possibly have demotivated you to ask questions now. But please, no, I like those questions. It's important. OK. Um, right. It's been a while since I've spoken, since it's summer. Good. Oh, the Dirichlet distribution, that's convenient. So this is, the, this is this process described as a graphical model and fully specified. And now I just want to tell you about the Dirichlet distribution. So, the Dirichlet distribution is an exponential family distribution over the simplex. Have you seen the exponential family yet? Yes, OK. So it's an exponential family distribution. Page in all of that information over the simplex, which are positive vectors that sum to 1. OK? And the Dirichlet distribution, so theta here is a point on the, it's really called the k minus 1 simplex. It's, the, it's distributions over k elements. and um, the Dirichlet is parameterized by a k vector alpha. Alpha is just k positive values um, uh, that parameterize the Dirichlet. And the density function of the Dirichlet is given here. So it's a product of each component to the power of alpha i minus 1 times uh, okay times this, which is the normalizing constant. And this gamma function is, a, is, you know, is one of the special functions. Um, and it's essentially like a, a real valued extension of the, vec of the factorial function. You can think of it as the factorial function. This constant here, this is just a function of alpha. So it's a constant with respect to the density, with respect to the random variable theta. This constant here just makes sure that this whole thing integrates to 1, which as you know, densities must do. So, um, this is the Dirichlet distribution, and like I said, it's a distribution over the simplex, over positive vectors that sum to 1, which are basically parameters to discrete distributions, to multinomial distributions. Okay? And the Dirichlet is special because it's conjugate to the multinomial. Have you learned about conjugacy? I think I know you did because I, I was here for that. Um, the Dirichlet is conjugate to the multinomial. What that means is that given multinomial, a multinomial observation or multinomial observations, the posterior distribution of theta, given those observations, is still a Dirichlet. I'm gonna, I think it's worth giving you the details of that in a second. Um, the parameter alpha controls the mean shape and the sparsity of theta. By sparsity of theta, I mean how many atoms in this distribution over atoms tend to have positive probability or, or they all will have some positive probability, but tend to have high probability. Um, and yeah, and so we're using the Dirichlet twice in this model. The topic proportions are a k-dimensional Dirichlet, and the topics are v-dimensional Dirichlet. Okay. Do you want to hear more details about the Dirichlet? 
Yes, good. Zubin does, so. <laughs> I feel like he speaks for everyone. For you, I think you want to. It's really fascinating. Um, okay, so the Dirichlet. Oh, I, I, I used to have like a really lame figure showing um, different examples of Dirichlets, and then I looked on Wikipedia and found a much cooler figure, and took it. So, <laughs> and um, anyway, so I'll explain this figure. Okay, so this figure shows a couple, let's forget the k minus one nonsense for a second. Let's call them three-dimensional Dirichlets, okay? Really, it's two-dimensional Dirichlets. I'm calling them three-dimensional Dirichlets. So um, here's what these figures look like. So remember, the Dirichlet represents a distribution over some number of elements. And let's say theta comes from a Dirichlet with parameters 1, 1, 1, okay? That means that as I draw random variables from theta, as I draw from this Dirichlet, I'm gonna get distributions over three elements, okay? So one such distribution, for example, so here's element A, B, and C. Um, one such distribution over three elements is the distribution that places all of its mass on A, okay? On this triangle, that's here. Okay, that places all of its mass on A. Another distribution places all of its mass on B. That's here, placing all of its mass on B. Okay, I won't insult your intelligence and draw it again. The third one places all of its mass on C. Now, the way this triangle looks works is that Every point, say, between A and B here represents C having probability zero and A having some positive probability and B having one minus that probability. Okay, so in other words, if I clamp the probability of C at zero and I um, put some probability on A and some probability on B, and let's assume that sums to one, then that point might be, let's see, B has a little more than A, that point might be right here on the simplex. Okay, analogous the points between A and C, analogous the points between B and C. Clear? So we can clamp one of these at zero, contemplate all the possible, essentially binary distributions between the other two points, and that represents the, the continuum along the edges of this triangle. Okay, and the points inside the triangle are the points where A has some probability, B has some probability, and C has some probability. So that might be that point. Okay, every point on the triangle is some point in the distribution space over distributions of three items. Okay? The Dirichlet places a distribution over that space. And the Dirichlet 1, 1, 1 is very special. If all the alphas are equal to 1, then Dirichlet 1, 1, 1 is the uniform distribution on this space. Every, uh, there's a nuance here, which is that these actual edges, the, the, the points on the line, are not possible. You can't have something have zero probability under a Dirichlet that has, that has zero probability. Um, but, but you can get arbitrarily close. So 1, 1, 1 on the interior of this triangle puts, uni, puts the same probability anywhere. Okay, it's called the uniform distribution. All right, and in general, so where on this triangle is the space where A, B, and C have equal probability? Yeah. Uh, one, I didn't understand one, 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 one. Is it like one third, one third, one third? Ah, let me, okay, thank you. So no, one, one, one. So remember, uh, the Dirichlet is parameterized by alpha, and alpha is a vector of length k of positive values. They can be anything. So in the th three Dirichlet, alpha has three components. And 1, 1, 1 refers to alpha 1 equal alpha 2 equal alpha 3 equal 1. Okay? And so those are the parameters to this distribution. And what I'm saying is that when you set those parameters exactly to 1, like that, that leads to a distribution where any point on the simplex has the same probability. Okay. Good. Um, but where is the point where alpha A, B, and C all have probability 1 third? 
Where is that point? It's in the middle, right, it's right here, okay? And so if you, if you have a Dirichlet where alpha one equals alpha two equals alpha three equals say five, what that does is puts a bump in the middle and spreads the contours around that bump like this somehow. Okay? In general, some properties of the Dirichlet that are worth knowing. The expectation of theta given alpha equals, so theta i, the, the expectation of the ith component. So this, we have a random, we have a distribution over this space. We can contemplate the expectation of any of these components, it's just a multivariate distribution. An expectation of theta i given alpha equals alpha i over the sum of the alpha. Okay, so with 5, 5, 5, the expectation of each of the components is gonna be a third because five over 15 is a third. Okay, and that's always true. The expectation of theta i given alpha is this. And so if you have a, an, an asymmetric Dirichlet distribution, if you have like alpha one equals 10, alpha two equals, well, I don't need to say it. So here we have our simplex and here is a distribution centered somewhere not in the middle, right? Here's a distribution center not in the middle. These are all distribution centered not in the middle. Okay, so that, that determines the location of this hump. Yeah? So the greater alpha value, the peakier the distribution? Yes, that's the next thing I'm gonna. You can't have less than one if one is a unicorn? Uh, no, yes and no are the answers to your questions. The first question was the greater alpha, the less peaky, yes. The next question was, you can't have alpha less than one? No, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain those in the, that in a bit. Okay, but first just to look for the location of the hump, the location of the hump is, is determined by this expectation. Okay, now let's get to the peakiness of the hump. So, and let's assume for now that alpha is greater than one. The alpha less than one case we'll deal with separately. Um, okay, I'll go over to here. There are can you see that? Can you all see the board over there? That way I only have to work with one set of lights. Okay, good. All right, so, the, the, so this is one important uh, piece of the Dirichlet parameterization. The other important piece is the sum of the alphas, okay? So the sum of the alphas determines the peakiness of the Dirichlet. When the sum of the alphas is, uh, is, is small, then the Dirichlet is gonna be very spread out, and the greater the sum of the alphas, the more peaky the Dirichlet becomes at this point, at its expectation, okay? Um, and sometimes you see this called, sometimes called S, and this is sometimes called M. Okay, so this is like the mean and this is the scaling, okay? And just to, to, so an alternative parameterization of the Dirichlet is as a point on the simplex, the mean, and a scaling parameter, S, which, is, which, is, which determines how peaky it is around the mean. And I'm saying this to foreshadow the various lectures on non-parametric Bayesian methods that are coming up next week where you parameterize the infinite dimensional Dirichlet in precisely the same way, okay? But just, Put that away in your brains somewhere safe. Okay. Um, now I need to go to my safe brain space. Think about what to say next. Peakiness, alpha less than one, and then posterior. Okay. This I think will be useful later. This is. These boards are heavier than at my university. I can see why you guys are so buff here. It's serious. This is very, this is very solid stuff. This, not all mathematics is for these boards. Okay, um, good. It's kind of invigorating. Uh, Alpha less than one. What happens?
okay? Equivalently, S less than one. What happens when alpha is less than one is you get sparsity, okay? So on the three simplex, here's our, our um, friendly triangle. So, you know, I've been drawing these Dirichlets like humps somewhere in the middle of the simplex. But on the th on, when alpha is less than one, you end up with a different shape. You end up with a shape that, that places increased probability at the corners of the simplex. Okay, so as contours, wait, let's see, let me, I think as contours, this looks like this, for example. Okay, so it's like a shape like, like that. Yeah, did I draw that wrong? What's that? Why is it equivalent to S less than one? S less than K. Ah, S less than K, thank you, yep. It's not? It's S less than K. Thanks. Okay. Um, the board gets heavier as you make more mistakes, actually. Um, so, was there another question or that's it? Did you have a question? Like that? They are to the outside. Okay, however you're supposed to draw this, let's say in two dimensions, it's really easy. So in, in two dimensions, you have between zero and one, right? You just have the probability of one thing and then probability of one minus the other thing. So when in the Dirichlet that I've been drawing, it looks like this, where you've got some mean and a, and a spread around the mean. And when alphas are less than one, you get this kind of shape. However that looks in three dimensions, I'm not sure. Okay. Is it just like the one over there except it's a minimum instead of a maximum? Exactly, it's like this. Can you just take the Yes, yes, fine. Very good. Okay, N now I can't even move it. All right. Erase this horrible picture, except pretty in kind of a spirograph sense. And yes, uh, yes, just take those <laughs> contours. That's Picture is the same. I don't know. It still doesn't seem right to me, but I don't, it doesn't matter. Let's move on. Okay. Um, so this is what happens when alpha is less than one. But really, when alpha is less than one, don't waste your time with two and three dimensional Dirichlets. Think about 50 and 100 dimensional Dirichlets. Okay? So now let's draw a, that space. So <laughs> the way you do that is, of course, you can't. But what we can do is I can. So let's say we have a 50-dimensional Dirichlet, so there's 50 components here, okay? And I encourage you in, you know, in R to sample a bunch of Dirichlets and plot them so that you can see what happens with different parameterizations of the Dirichlet. And in saying that, I'm encouraging you to do two things. One is to do that, and two is to use R. So, um, I can really go on and on about R. Now, so let's say alpha was greater than one. So, so let's call, let's say alpha looked like this. Okay? And let's say there's 50 of them or whatever. Okay, so let's say that's alpha. All right? Then when we draw from this Dirichlet, we're going to get shapes that sort of look like this, but that vary from this in some way or another, subject to how big alpha is. Right? So, Again, if you do this in R, you can, you can easily plot, you know, 100 points on the simplex drawn from this distribution and see how it kind of looks like this, but sometimes this one will be a little bigger, sometimes this one will be a little smaller, sometimes this one will be a little bigger, and so on. Is that clear? I'm not going to do it because I think it'll be too time consuming. Okay. When alpha is much smaller than one, however, when each alpha is smaller than one, or some of the alphas are smaller than one, let's, let's be simple and let's talk about what's called the exchangeable Dirichlet. The exchangeable Dirichlet is Dirichlet alpha, 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 and so on. Okay, there's just one parameter, one scalar, and we assume that M is, the, is, is right in the center of the simplex. Okay? So, when alpha is smaller than one in the exchangeable Dirichlet, what you get are sparse distributions. So you get things like this. OK? 
okay, where only some of the atoms have positive probability and many of them have probability very, very close to zero. Again, file this away in your brains because this is going to have an important connection in non-parametric Bayesian methods. Um, now, which, especially in the exchangeable Dirichlet, which components have positive mass? Those are uh, up to the, uh, those are totally at random. However, as alpha gets smaller and smaller and smaller, fewer components will have positive mass. Okay, so this is a sparse exchangeable Dirichlet. Does that answer your question about alpha less than one? Okay. Um, finally, any other questions? Yeah. If you have alpha equals one, you have uniform distribution, so it's not sparse. That's right. And if you have alpha equals five, it's also some key curve, it's not really sparse. Precisely. But when alpha is less than one, as you get further and further below towards closer to zero, you get sparser and sparser and sparser draws from your Dirichlet. So when theta comes from a Dirichlet and z comes from theta, okay, or let's say zn comes from So that's, that's like a little piece of our LDA model, right? Theta comes from Dirichlet, Zn comes from a multinomial with parameter theta. This is also called a discrete distribution. Technically, it's not a multinomial unless you have another number there, which is how many draws, but don't worry about it. So Zn comes from multinomial theta, theta comes from a Dirichlet. You can ask the question, what is P of theta given Z1 through M? In other words, if I observe N topic assignments, what is the conditional distribution of the topic proportions given those topic assignments, okay? And what conjugacy means is that if we let n, z, 1 through big N be the counts of each atom, in other words, if I saw a topic 13 six times, then n sub 13 of z, 1 through n equals 6, okay? It's just a little counting function. Clear? Okay. Then, theta given z1 through n is a Dirichlet with parameters alpha plus n1 to n. Okay, we just add the number of times we saw topic 13 to the alpha parameter for topic 13, and that's the new Dirichlet parameter. So notice that you will rarely have sparse, well, no, no, don't notice anything. Yeah. That's the posterior Dirichlet. Okay, and so notice that your instinct earlier that as the, as the sum of the alphas gets larger, you get a peakier and peakier distribution. That's mirrored here. As we see more and more observations, our posterior gets peakier and peakier and peakier. And that's very intuitive. As I, as I roll the die more and more and more, my idea of what the distribution of the faces are is going to become more, I'm going to become more and more confident about it. And so it's the, it's the whole idea of the prior speaking so loudly and the data speaking loud, as loud proportional to how much data you saw. As you see more data, you become more and more confident in the estimate that that data gives you. Okay. We've totally diverged from topic modeling. So, any questions about this? And then we can get back to it for 15 minutes. Okay. Yeah? Uh, in, in, the, in the prior, uh, I mean, when, when you say sparse, do you mean that the other, uh, the other ones are exactly zero? No, close to zero. They're going to be like 0. 0.00001. You can see that in R. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will turn the lights off. By the way, um, when you sample from a Dirichlet, in order to do it, well, I'll tell you how to do it later. Well, let's keep going now. Okay. Um, okay, very good. We're back. So, I'm going to turn the lights on in one second. So, here we, again, we have the LDA model. LDA is a mixed, it's called a mixed membership model in statistics, and it really builds on the work, uh, the seminal LSA work, latent semantic analysis of Dear Wester et al., and probabilistic latent semantic analysis from Thomas Hoffman. Um, um, and actually, let's not go into details about this. The reason it's called a mixed membership model is that you can think of the model where each document comes from a single cluster as like, a, that's a mixture model, where we have, each document is associated with a single Z. 
And um, here, since documents are associated with theta, a distribution over clusters, then each document can be associated with multiple components. That's what, that's what the mixed membership idea is. So when you're reading the Journal of Bayesian Analysis or the Annals of Applied Statistics and you hear about mixed membership models of rank data and this data and that data, you can think about LDA as an instance of a mixed membership model. Okay, that's in, in statistics, that's what this is called. Um, and for document collections and other grouped data, I should have emboldened that, grouped data, this is, rather than thinking of a document as a single data point, it's really a group of data points. The data are the words, and the document represents the group of words. For group data, often the mixed membership assumption is more appropriate than a simple finite mixture, which is the natural alternative. Okay? Um, and I should mention that in statistics, this same model was invented for population genetics analysis, and it's had a lot of impact there by uh, Stevens and Pritchard. So there, they don't care about documents. What they care about is uh, real science, and um, they are modeling people as being uh, mixtures of their various um, uh, ancestry. So, you know, it's only my, my case is a bad case because everybody's from the same small town in Hungary. But um, my wife, like her family, her mom's from Denmark and her dad's from... Uh, <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's a pretty, he's a character. Uh, he's from Canada, basically, let's say. And, um, and, and so, you know, her genes are kind of a mixture of the, very, of the different populations that she comes from. It's a, it's a lovely combination. I should say that to the video. Um, and, uh, and, and so this model is a model for, for looking at how people's genes mix and then what, what are the results of it. You can think of the populations as the topics and the people as mixing over the topics, okay? So uh, let's get on before I make some kind of marriage error. All right, good. So, again, the, from a collection of documents, um, this is all a nice story, but we don't get to observe any of this stuff. We don't get to observe the topics or the topic proportions or the topic assignments, and that's really the central algorithmic goal of, of uh, working with a model like this. You want to infer all of this nice structure so we can use it. So the idea is to infer the per word topic assignment ZDN, the per document topic proportions theta D, and the per corpus topic distributions beta K. Okay, and then to use posterior expectations, basically the expectation of all those things given the words, here's the hidden variables, here are the words, use the posterior expectations of these things to perform whatever task it is we care about, such as information retrieval, document similarity, classification, whatever it is you're doing. Okay? Let's see if this works. Good. Oops. Okay, so there are a lot of approximate, okay, we will, in the second part of this talk, we're going to see how we can't actually compute the exact posterior like we can here in this nice conjugate model. And so a lot of approximate posterior inference algorithms for this model have been developed, including uh, mean field variational methods. This is what uh, we're, I'm going to describe later on. Expectation propagation, which I know you learned about a bit yesterday. Um, collapsed Gibbs sampling, which I'll talk about later on, and collapsed variational inference, which is very exciting, but I will only allude to it later on. Um, and there's also been some work on how to compare these different types of inference algorithms and, and, and how well they do. There's a great paper from ICML this year comparing them. Um, and also some theoretical work about collapsed variational inference versus mean field variational inference that I worked on with a student. Um, we're going to get into details of approximate posterior inference later on, I guess on Thursday. But um, for now, I want to show you a little bit of uh, let's assume we have an approximate posterior algorithm that we like, and let's look at some real data and what this model does with real data. Okay, any questions about this? So this is the model. The only things that, that are observed are the words, and so we want to fill in the rest of this with approximate posterior inference. Okay. Okay, so for these first uh, pieces, I want to look at the OCR collection of Science Magazine from 1990 to 2000. Um, so, just to give you an idea of what this data is, the, um, basically, uh, have you all seen jstor.org? 
Okay, good. So JSTOR is a, an online archive of scientific articles. And what they do, it's an amazing project, is they take the original bound articles and they scan them and then they run them through optical character recognition software and then they index the original scans via the output of the OCR algorithm. So the, it's cool because, so you know, it'll screw stuff up like this is two columns and maybe their OCR software can't handle two columns and it, maybe it doesn't get all the words right but it's pretty accurate and maybe the punctuation is totally bogus but that's okay. But for doing search, when you want to search for a word like, um, you know, phenotype, then uh, as long as it got phenotype a bunch of times in the article, you're going to get the right scan back and since you never interact specifically with the noisy OCR, it's a very effective system for searching um, online, for searching articles online that are archived and they have science all the way back to 1880. We'll in fact see that later on. Okay, but of course JSTOR has a problem which is that they have millions and millions of articles um, but they're only organized by journal and by date. And what they want is a system where people can can go through and browse and, and examine these articles in a topic oriented way but since they've scanned so many articles it's, it's out of the question to, to annotate these scans with keywords moreover it's in the, they want this to be automatic they, they don't want to have to read every article and assign it keywords the whole point is that you don't have to do that you can just put them through a machine and then let scholars use them effectively so um, they're interested in looking at the kind of topic decomposition of their archives so here we're taking their collection of Science Magazine for 10 years. We're looking at 17,000 documents. This is 11 million words, and we used a vocabulary of 20,000 terms. Basically, uh, as a practical point, you typically remove stop words, words like the, of, but, or and, um, and very rare words, which don't affect the inference much. <laughs> or, somebody recently told me, might affect the inference badly. We can talk about that later. Um, but th so this is the, the documents we're going to analyze and we fit a 100 topic LDA model using variational inference but could have been anything. Okay, so here's that same article that I showed you. I should say that this article was actually in a test set. So this article we didn't, we didn't fit with. Um, this is the article, How Many Genes Does an Organism Need to Survive in an Evolutionary Sense? And using posterior inference, so here are the WDNs for this article, right? I didn't draw the graphic model, but here are the WDNs. And with posterior inference, this is the expected value of theta given those Ws. Okay, so I won't turn on the lights for this, but it's just the expectation of theta D given W1 through N and the topics that we estimated. Okay? That's what this is an approximation of. So this is like the real version of the cartoon histogram that I drew for you before. It's saying, look, I've got these hundred topics, we haven't looked at them yet, and given this new article, here, is, here are the topic proportions that are associated with that article. Clear? Okay? And you can see that it's not like it's using every topic for this particular article. It's saying this topic has high probability, this topic has high probability, this topic has high probability, and so on. And even though it has 100 topics to choose from, it's not as though it's using all of them to describe this article. So we're getting some description of this article in terms of these topics. Okay. What's that? We, we, so this was all done through posterior inference. So let me just, whoops, I'm going the wrong way. Don't look, don't look, this is secret. Um, okay, so remember, these things are all latent. The topics are latent, the topic assignments are latent, the topic proportions are latent. We never observed them. So with approximate posterior inference, we inferred them just from the collection of articles. And we're gonna look at them in a second, unless you look before at the secret stuff. Okay. So here are the topic proportions, and now let's finally look at these topics. Let's look at the top words from the top topics in this article, and these are the topics I showed you before. You can see, the, so, so what I've done here, instead of showing you all 20,000 words and the probabilities and us squinting and looking at the numbers, I've ordered the words by probability. So the most probable words in this topic, which is the most probable topic in that document, are words like human, genome, DNA, genetic, gene, sequence, gene, molecular, and so on. 
Another top topic are words like evolution, evolutionary species, organisms, life, origin, biology, and so on. And here is disease, host, bacteria, diseases, resistance, and the computer modeling words. Okay, and I want to emphasize that we didn't have to set any probabilities here. All we did was, was arrange painstakingly with JSTOR and their lawyers to get their data. Then we ran our algorithm on that data. And this topical decomposition of this article comes out of running that algorithm. There's no probabilities need to be set anywhere. This is what's called unsupervised learning. I should have mentioned that 16 times by now, and I didn't. OK? You do still need to set the number of topics, which we can talk about how to do that in the later part of the series. Yeah. Yeah. So why, I'm just curious, why do you not use any aggressive yeah, so again, we should, we, we, you could stem, and, and if, if this were done in some kind of industrial grade uh, way, then we would probably stem to make the best possible interpretable topics for the JSTOR users. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, and so you can see that this is capturing what seem to be thematically related words, which I'm, I'm going to want us to contemplate in a little bit. Okay, here's another example. This is about chaotic beetles and, um, oh, Michael Hassel. And, and this is about mathematical models of insects and beetles. And again, we can play the same game. We do posterior inference, we get back topic proportions, and we look at the most probable words from the same model for this document. And you see words like words about mathematical problems, words about, words about models and statistics, words about um, like, uh, uh, selection and um, I don't know, I don't even know what the word is for this. Population theory um, and words about ecology and so on going with the beetles. And so again, uh, these, these topics and these topics are all in the same model um, and it's the, the, the approximate posterior inference algorithm is deciding to use them in different ways depending on the different observed words. Okay, and so these tools then, once you've marked up your entire corpus with topics and with um, topic proportions and so on, you can use these tools to browse the collection. So here, for example, is another article from Science. Here are some top topics from this, from this article. Here I'm, I'm showing which words were assigned to different topics. This usually makes a little bit less sense because it has to assign every word to a topic, even ones that have low probability. And, but you can see things like statistics, evaluating data, statistical means, comparisons in one topic, words like acid and proteins and spacing and amino in one topic, and words like uh, general text provides recent, that seems like a bogus topic, or not a bogus topic, but seems like these words, it had no better place to put them. But you can see that it's decomposed this article into multiple overlapping recurring patterns of words. Um, and then you can do things like ask for similar documents according to these topic proportions. So rather than use words to find document similarity, we can use the topics to find document similarity. And here are the titles of the of the documents that are most similar to this document by topic. And that can be a form of what's called query expansion, for example, where if I write an article all about my cat and I use the word cat, and you write an article all about your cat and you use the word feline, then a, a traditional document similarity metric won't say that our articles are similar, even though our cats might be extremely similar. And whereas a topic model knowing that cat and feline are somehow in the same group will say that our articles are similar and that indeed our cats are, have very similar personalities. So um, this is the way that you can use these, these types of models. And in fact, if you look at rexa.org, I don't know if you've seen this, this is a, a project that came out of UMass Amherst from Andrew McCallum's group. And they, there they use topic models to help you browse a large collection of computer science academic articles. Um, so it's worth, worth checking that out. Questions? Yeah. Does it turn out that the top words in each topic are similar? That they are like, um, you know, words with little meaning? Good question. So um, I said that we remove stop words, words like of, but, and, or the. But really, well, not really. But what that means is that we really remove words that occur in all of the articles. So if a word occurs in all of the articles, then 
we remove it. In fact, if it occurs in more than 90% of the articles, then we remove it because your intuition is correct that the model is going to want to place those words with high probability in all the topics because they occur so frequently that um, they don't help decompose the collection. So that's typically why we do that. There are ways of doing that post hoc, after you get the topics, looking at the, instead of ordering the topics by probable, most probable words, there are other <laughs> scores you can use to order the words. Um, I can talk about that on Thursday if you like. But that's a good question, and it leads me to this question for you. So, actually, I won't show the answer. I, yeah. Yeah. Is there an intuition why in that is, um, it's not, why doesn't it happen that uh, rather than putting those words into all of the topics, yes. why doesn't the model discover a new topic which only has those words and this topic will appear in all the documents? Uh, I, there is an intuition for that, but I'm, I, I'm not going to answer it because it, it relates to my next question, which is for you. You, plural. Um, what, why on earth does this work? That's the question. So, you know, I, I told you, oh, don't, don't look at that, that's secret. I, you know, I, I showed you this generative model, and um, let's, I, even let's look at this picture, it's better. Look at this picture. So here's the generative process, and, you know, we seem to just make it up. Um, and consistently, we get back these distributions over words that look like thematically related terms. And when you're doing applied Bayesian modeling, it's important to think both about the prior, which is what we're specifying here essentially, and to think about the posterior. So why could we expect to find these kinds of combinations of words as highly probable words under the posterior? And if so, why? So, um, it's time to go, unfortunately, but I, I want you to, to contemplate that, and then on Thursday we'll begin by hearing your answers to, those, to that question. I, I have an answer, um, but who knows if it's right, and, and I'm interested in, in, in you thinking about what the posterior distribution means here and why it might do something like this and what, it's what actually this is capturing somehow in plain English. I mean, I want the description to be in plain English. You don't have to analyze English documents. What is this capturing? I want to know that answer in plain English. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Thank